for the first nine years of my career, I spent time in the field of design, designing high-tech products and services. <clears throat> but I got to a point where I started to feel that I was missing something. And I began to ask myself why I was making the things that I was making. And I didn't have an answer. So I wanted to spend some time away from my industry, and I entered the field of art. And I spent the next four years of my life at both the Rhode Island School of Design and Brown University conducting research on what it means to make something, how it works as a creative process, and why it matters to our lives. And to do the research, I spent as much time as I possibly could make, using my hands to make objects with clay, metal, wood, plastic, all sorts of different materials. And I also used my whole body to make performances by dancing and acting. And as I did this, I kept seeing the same pattern happen over and over and over again. And the pattern was as follows. The way I think often prevents my ability to create new meaning and value from my interaction with others. And I only realized what that limiting way of thinking was in hindsight. Let me give you an example. So one day, I was in the wood shop, and I was making a piece of artwork with wood. And I was using a Japanese handsaw at the moment, and this is a picture of the saw I was using. And this is how it sounded like. So I was sawing away, and all of a sudden, a carpenter standing all the way at the other end of the shop starts yelling at me. He's like, hey, you, listen to the wood. And I was like, excuse me? And he starts walking towards me. And he says, you have to understand, the wood is very honest. If you're willing to listen, it'll tell you how you're doing. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and he says, watch this. And he takes the wood I've been sawing, unclamps it, lowers it down, reclamps it, and says, do it again. And I do it again. And this is the how the sound changed. And once again, this is how it previously sounded. The problem was that I had clamped the wood too high. So every time I would saw, it would wobble a bit. And that was creating a lot of rumbling noise. But I swear to God, I had heard that sound. But I, didn't, I thought it was just a generic sound of sawing. I didn't find it particularly meaningful or valuable. But in hindsight, of course, this was obvious. So obvious, in fact, I couldn't understand why I hadn't thought of it in the first place. So incidents like this was happening over and over again. And it was easy to brush this off as kind of being mundane. And hindsight being 2020 is not a new idea. But I intuitively felt that there was something more to this than meets the eye. But I couldn't quite articulate it. <clears throat> that is until I realized that this was an, actually an echo from my past. You see, more than 10 years ago, I had a close friend who was suffering from bipolar depression. And at the time, I really wanted to help her. So I started off by reading everything there was about depression. I read books, magazines, articles, you name it. I read them all. And I eventually got to a psychiatrist looking for some advice. And she said, Slim, if you want to help your friend, the most you can do is try and empathize with her. And I was like, how do you do that? And she said, well, the next time she gets depressed, sit down with her and listen to her very closely. And if you think you can understand how she's feeling and why, express that back to her. And if that expression resonates with her, she'll feel understood, and that'll make her feel better. Which sounded simple enough. But then I tried it. And I quickly realized that this was a lot more difficult than I thought. Because the whole time I was trying to listen to her, she kept yelling, screaming, and bawling. 
telling me that I did not understand. So what was I supposed to do? I kept revising the story I was telling her over and over and over again, hoping I would eventually get it right. But I couldn't. Nearly half an hour had passed by, and I was just sitting there with all my energy drained, unable to figure out what it was that I was missing. But then something occurred to me. It occurred to me that maybe something I had said to her earlier in the day had something to do with her feeling the way she was feeling now. So I told her that. And like magic, she stopped yelling and screaming as she sat there sobbing. You see, what I realized at that moment was that everything I'd been telling her up to that point was framed in such a way that it was all her fault. And I had nothing to do with it. I thought of her as a problem to be solved, and I myself as a problem solver, thinking that a problem solver could not possibly be a part of the problem. But of course, in hindsight, I actually started off thinking I already knew the answer. And the answer was so simple. She just had to cheer up. I thought if I could only logically convince her to accept this wonderfully simple solution, that she would snap out of her depression. But of course, I misunderstood. The, problem to, the solution to the problem wasn't a matter of selling her on my ideas. It was coming to realize my own assumptions, my implicit role playing, my unawareness of my own prejudice. If anybody had to snap out of it, it was me. And once I realized this, all I had to do was express that story back to her sincerely. A story so completely unexpected, yet in hindsight so simple, so obvious, and even logical, that I couldn't understand why I hadn't thought of it in the first place. You see, reflecting on that incident, what I've come to realize is that the process it takes to empathize with another person mirrors the creative process. Now, why do I say that? In the beginning of the story I just told, I started off not empathizing with my friend, which is to say that I felt separate from her. I saw her as, an, as, an, as someone I was looking at or experiencing objectively from a distance and with no bias. But in the end, I empathized with her, which is to say that I felt as if the boundary between her and I had blurred. I had a subjective experience, enough for me to feel a sense of connection, of oneness. Now, if empathy is a word we invented to explain how we can empathize with somebody or go from not empathizing to empathizing, I want to give a name to the process it takes for us to go from not empathizing to empathizing. And I want to call it realizing empathy. Now, how then does empathy realize? Well, sometimes it realizes involuntarily. I'm sure you've all had an experience where you're watching an actor or a singer, and you can instantly feel that sense of connection. But maybe you've also had an experience where you were in the shower, and you all of a sudden went, oh, that's what mom was talking about. That's also an example of empathy realizing involuntarily. Except we have another name for that situation, which we call the light bulb moment. <clears throat> but that's a key signature of a creative process. A technical term being having an insight. That's precisely what happened between me and my friend. But now, what got me to that insight? What did I have to do to get that insight? Well, many things. But first of all, I had to engage my friend in a conversation. In other words, the conversation was required before that light bulb could go off. And in, during that conversation, what else happened? 
Because I'm thinking of all the different things that happened during the conversation, and there's many, many different things that happened. But if there's one thing I want to highlight today, it's that I learned the choice to become honest. And now let me explain what I mean by learning the choice to be honest, because it's not the same thing as not lying. <clears throat> Now remember the story of wood. Did I think the sound of sawing was insignificant? Of course I did. Remember the story of my friend. Did I know about the event that had happened earlier in the day? Of course I did. But did I ever outwardly acknowledge, express, or otherwise act on that honesty? No. In fact, I ignored it. I brushed it off. I was not being honest. But that's not because I had the intention <clears throat> to deceive. It's because I didn't have a choice. After all, I didn't see a value in being honest about that. Why should I be honest about that particular thing in that particular moment if I don't see the value? What would be the point? It's like sitting in a lecture hall <clears throat> listening to a, a speaker that I cannot understand. Maybe I feel stupid and lost, but I look around and nobody's asking any questions. So what do I do? I keep my mouth shut. Why? Because I don't want to be judged stupid. There's no value in that happening. In fact, the value is negative. But if I'm not honest, that's the only way in which we can learn that. So what happens as we go through the creative process is that we don't just create things. We create new meaning and value from something we perceived little to no value or meaning previously. And in that process, we learn a new choice. A new choice with which to not only see others, but also ourselves, to be honest with ourselves. And now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is easy. It's in fact a struggle a lot of times, as it was the case for me. But if we want to learn a new choice, a new choice with which to see, we have to be willing to listen to another. Just, whether it's a piece of wood or another person, it's only when we're willing to listen to another we feel is separate from ourselves and manage to empathize that we'll be surprised by a new insight. Now, my old job, I used to have this thing called the performance review. And it's, this, it's the case where your boss sends an email out to everybody so they can send you some direct feedback. But the feedback is filtered through my boss. So it's mostly um, anonymous. And the feedback happens only once a year. So by the time I get the feedback, I've completely lost track of what had happened. And I don't have enough details to make, make the feedback meaningful. So one year, I decided to do something very different. I said, I invited all the people I'd worked with to a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I said, I, I promised them I'm just going to shut up and listen. No defending, no argument, just complete and utter silence on my part. And one conversation in particular left a huge impression on me. Because as soon as we sat down, the person said, Slim, you're intimidating. And I was like, me? Intimidating? I thought I was the sweetest person in the entire world. <laughs> but he said, because you project so much confidence in the way you speak and the way you lead meetings, I don't feel comfortable sharing my disagreements with you. He said, because you come so prepared with such a clear vision in mind, I don't feel comfortable contributing my own ideas. I was surprised. I had no idea that my behaviors could be perceived that way. And to this day, I, I can't say how grateful I am to have had that opportunity to see myself in a different way. In fact, I rethought the very idea of what it means to look into the mirror. 
Because when we look into the mirror, it's not just that we're looking at ourselves. We're looking at ourselves from a different perspective. It's only when we're willing to look at ourselves from a different perspective that we can, we can learn something new about ourselves that we do not or cannot otherwise know. Now, if there's anything I've learned in the past five years of doing this research, it's that we don't see anyone or anything the way they are. We see them as we want to. And for that reason, the first step to realizing empathy is to practice respect. But we live in a time where we think respecting is synonymous to tolerating or accommodating. We say things like, I respectfully disagree, which really means you're wrong, but I'm nice. <laughs> Enough to tolerate your stupidity. That's not what it means to respect. The Latin root for respect is respectus, which means the act of looking back at one. In other words, the very act of choosing how to look has everything to do with respect. To respect, you have to accept the fact that when others or even yourself seem weird, it's because you expect them to be something else. When to respect, you have to accept the fact that there's always the possibility of finding a new angle from which to look, where that new angle will be surprising, but so obvious in hindsight. I'll end with a, a summary. When we think of the idea of connection, we think of two separate circles connected by a line. But in light of the stories I shared with you today, I want to propose an alternate model. I want you to envision a whole circle separated by a line we call judgment. And by becoming honest, by becoming aware of how we judge at any given moment, and not repressing or, or disregarding or brushing it off, by learning the choice to become honest about them. We can momentarily blur that line and empower ourselves to experience the whole circle and to experience that sense of connection. Thank you.